The 660 horsepower Electromotive Corporation SW1 in cap switcher number 1901, that was a mouthful, has an incredible life story. It was built in an astonishingly 1939, the same year that the FT Streamline diesel freight unit was introduced by EMC. The FT diesel is the engine that single high handedly wiped out the steam locomotive. The 1901 was first tested on the Atlantic coastline and was soon rejected and returned to EMC after being found inadequate for the duties for which it was to be assigned. Worthy of mention is that the ACL had also tested an ALCO HH660 which it ironically numbered number 1900. 1901 was then resold to the Richmond Terminal Railroad and placed into service on March 15, 1940 as the Richmond Terminal Railway engine number 1. During the early years of World War II, it was found that the engine wasn't heavy enough for the increased passenger work at the Broad Street Station, so it was transferred to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, all while substituting it at the Broad Street Station with one of the 1,000 horsepower Alco diesel switchers which the RFMP then had on order. On April 1, 1944, the little EMD was purchased outright by the RFMP and was renumbered RFMP number 50. The engine was used at Bolton Yard in the vicinity of the Richmond Freight Station until it was sold yet again and shipped to the Canton Railway Company in Baltimore on March 30, 1956 as locomotive number 26. Coincidentally, the Canton Railroad was the original owner of five other SW1 diesels numbered 21 through 25. Over the years and through several more owners, it slowly worked its way up the East Coast toiling for such companies as the New Jersey Contracting Corporation, also as number 26, and the McCormick Sand and Gravel Company in South Amboy, New Jersey, again as number 26. It finally made its way into the Keystone State and the Tawanda Monroe Shippers Lifeline, a tiny short line operation in Tawanda in February 1977, again as number 26. While there, it was painted into a Lehigh Valley inspired color scheme, the one that you see here. In December of 2009, the railroad and the locomotive were both bought by the Reading and Northern and the number 26 somehow ended up at Steamtown in late 2014. I say somehow because it was always my impression that the Reading and Northern's owner, Andy Muller, had a beef with the Pennsylvania Northeastern Regional Rail Authority, similar to the one he currently has with the North Shore system of central Pennsylvania. After being stored for the last few years, the 1901, formerly Lehigh Valley number 26, looks like it's coming back to life and being put back into operation. The Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway was a tourist railroad that operated passenger excursions along the Reading and Northern trackage from the former Central Railroad of New Jersey Station in Jim Thorpe to Old Penhaven Junction following the Lehigh River through the Lehigh Gorge State Park. Excursions ran on weekends, holidays, and some weekdays between May and December. In 2019, an audit by the Borough of Jim Thorpe revealed that the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway allegedly owed the Borough $90,000 in amusement taxes. The issue went to court and the judge sided with the Borough with the railroad appealing the decision. The railway threatened to leave the borough of Jim Thorpe over the unpaid taxes and ceased operations in November 2019, refusing to pay the amusement tax, saying that the tourist railroad was not an amusement.
Although the operations shut down in 2019, they have since been reinstated in one form or another. The regular excursion consisted of a 16-mile, 70-minute round trip out of Jim Thorpe following the Lehigh River to the Lehigh Gorge State Park. In October, the railway operated abbreviated 45-minute trips that offered views of fall foliage in the Lehigh Gorge State Park. There were several special excursions that were operated by the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway. The hometown high bridge train was a 30-mile, two-hour round-trip excursion that ran on the first full weekend in October from Jim Thorpe through Nesquahoney to the 1,168-foot-long hometown high bridge that passes 168 feet over the Little Schuylkill River, offering views of the striking fall foliage. The bike train was a 25-mile, one-hour, one-way trip to Jim Thorpe to Whitehaven, and it allowed passengers to ride their bicycles for the 25-mile journey along the Lehigh Gorge Trail from Whitehaven back to Jim Thorpe. The Santa Claus special train operated out of Jim Thorpe between the day after Thanksgiving and the weekend before Christmas, with a visit from Santa Claus aboard that train. Today, the r &N operates passenger excursions out of the Reading Outer Station located outside of Reading, Pennsylvania in Muhlenberg Township with rail diesel car trains running from the Reading Outer Station to Jim Thorpe with an intermediate stop in Port Clinton. The train runs from Reading and Port Clinton to Jim Thorpe in the morning, allowing passengers to explore Jim Thorpe. Then return trip leaves Jim Thorpe in the late afternoon and returns to Port Clinton and Reading in the evening. This excursion operates on select weekends and holidays from May to November. Getting back to the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway proper, trains were usually diesel powered and consisted of an open air car, standard coaches, a gondola car that allowed passengers to transport the bicycles aboard the train and ride their bicycles back to Jim Thorpe and the caboose. Number 5033 and the trailing 5022 shown moving through Taylor Yard and up track 17 are what the RNN classifies as SD50 M's. The 5033 was one of the diesels that was assigned to exclusive Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway service and wears the special blue and silver paint scheme that was put out to pasture by the Cornell Red and Yellow GP30s when they arrived on the property. The GP30s were themselves displaced and regulated into everyday freight service shortly after working for the Scenic Railway. Today, Excursions will usually run with newly painted ex-Norfolk Southern GP38-2s along with the newly purchased F9A and F7B or the mighty x rating T1484 number 2102. The 5033 was eventually painted like the other ST50s at the time in the standard green and silver. Today, the 5033 and the 5022 have been reunited, sitting in the Penobscot yard awaiting for their next call of duty. The 5014 is the first of nine SD50s on the road, including three standard SD50s, two SD50Ms, and four SD50-2s acquired from CSX. One of the SD50-2s is an XB&O, which in turn means that it's an X chassis system. The 5014 is an X Union Pacific and Missouri Pacific, both of the same number. In fact, with the exception of the XCSXers that are numbered from 5018 to 5021, the other five have had the same road number their whole lives. Although this is speculation, I suspect the reason is because they were bought early in Reading and Northern's railroading days and renumbering a locomotive is an expensive process that involves more than just slapping on a new number. 
Number boards have to be changed and amendments have to be made to numerous mechanical documents and I estimate that renumbering a locomotive today can easily cost multiple thousands of dollars. And as long as we're talking about the 5014, here's a picture of her in 2004 on Penobscot and wearing fresh paint and coupled to the SD40-2 number 3051. Note the variations in their paint schemes, the SD50s versus the SD40-2s. Durier Yard, formerly Coxton Yard and also sometimes referred to as Pittston Junction or West Pittston Yard is a railroad yard in the Wyoming Valley region of northeastern Pennsylvania. Durier Yard was established in the early adolescence of railroad history in Pennsylvania by the Lehigh Valley Railroad and operated by that railroad for many decades. Today it's operated by the Reading and Northern Railroad. The yard lies in the borough of Duryea, a bedroom neighborhood of Pittston, itself a secondary community of Wilkes-Barre and Scranton, and as such is part of the Wilkes-Barre-Scranton metropolitan area. Physically, the yard is located on the main branch of the Susquehanna River and in the peninsula formed by the confluence of the Lackawanna. In the yard proper, both northbound main lines are of equal height. Running further northeast, the more northerly track to Mountaintop flies over the more southerly track to Scranton. Both elevations are well below Main Street at the underpass below Coxton Road. Coxton Road leads immediately to some light industry, but then herded by the Campbell's Ledge, parallels the yard and subsequent northbound main line to Mahoopin. The main Wyoming Valley entrance is through a rail yard wide to the main line running westbound on both sides of the Susquehanna and eastbound to Mountaintop. Historically, the Y was doubled and connected to a long staging track, but only parts of the doubling remain today. Continuing into the yard from the Y is to cross a bridge that was originally built for four tracks, although today now only contains three tracks. This lead historically contained several crossovers fanning out to various service tracks and buildings within the yard. On the north side, the yard connects to the Lehigh Valley Railroad's northbound main line to Sarah, Pennsylvania. Although the 2017 Reading and Northern System map names Duryea Yard as such, in July 2013, a newly hung sign indicated that the Reading and Northern had renamed the Duryea Yard as the Muller Yard. Today, some people call it Duryea Yard, some people call it Pittston Yard, some call it the Muller Yard as the new sign indicates, but people like me, Old school people like me still call it Coxton Yard. While chartered in 1846, the construction of the Lehigh Valley Railroad was delayed for lack of investment until the early 1850s when the energetic businessman Asa Packer was elected to the board of managers. The Lehigh Valley Railroad was conceived with the idea of attempting to break the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company's monopoly over bulk goods shipping on the Wyoming Valley, Lehigh, Delaware route, which was dominated by the Lehigh Canal from Whitehaven, Pennsylvania, downriver to eastern Pennsylvania. The Lehigh Valley Railroad initially connected at Jim Thorpe to the Beaver Meadows Railroad and extended to cross the Delaware just above Easton into Phillipsburg, New Jersey, where it connected to the Morris Canal, the Central Railroad of New Jersey, and two smaller railroads. This gave the valley passenger traffic from Philadelphia and Trenton, New Jersey, and points south from New York City and rail-connected New England communities, along with freight traffic to and from all of the connected partners. Even before expanding northward to reach Wilkes-Barre, the Lehigh Valley had become the trunk line for shipping by rail in the entire Lehigh Valley. Shortly after purchasing the Penn Haven and Whitehaven Railroad, the Lehigh Valley completed its line to Wilkes-Barre in 1868. At that time, all industrial activity was powered in some form by coal, and the Wilkes-Barre-Scranton area was the center of the coal mining industry. The Lehigh Valley and its competitors expanded rapidly, and the valley needed a yard to handle the traffic. That yard was the Duryea Yard. Duryea Yard was originally constructed in 1870 by the Lehigh Valley Railroad as a turnaround and staging hub for coal transport from the coal region to eastern big city markets. Bulk goods shipping until the 1920s was mainly anthracite coal, 
the new wonder fuel only made available after 1820, but the Lehigh Canal and railroads that followed also carried timber, lumber, cement, iron ore, stone goods, finished goods, anthracite pig iron, and finished iron work, and later, steel. Owned by the Lehigh Canal and Navigation Company, as it did many of the mines in the southern coal region from Trescal, Pennsylvania, south to Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, thence east along most of the Panther Creek Valley and the Nesquahoning Creek Valley. Duryea Yard remained busy during the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Following World War II, large dump trucks began to supplant rail for bulk coal hauling. Furthermore, Rail companies began to dieselize to cut costs and remain competitive as the interstate highway system provided a novel form of highly subsidized competition. Even though the shift to interstate highways was somewhat delayed in the mountainous eastern Pennsylvania terrain, the shift to diesel was already eliminating much of the Lehigh Valley Railroad's revenues. Ironically, the railroad's steadiest profits came from carrying the cement and steel products necessary to build the interstate highways. The Duryea Rail Yard declined as I-81 finally came to Scranton and airline travel began to compete with railroads on the few products that needed to be shipped faster than by trucks. By the start of the 21st century, Duryea Yard was mostly unused. In late 2009 and early 2010, the Reading and Northern expanded operations due to the emergence of Marcellus Shale natural gas drilling in northeastern Pennsylvania. The railroad spent $100,000 to transform the yard into a sand transloading facility to transfer sand from rail cars to trucks, which is then used by the natural gas well drillers in the Marcellus Shale region. The upgrades to the rail yard included laying new track to accommodate 100 new rail cars and constructing a facility to store and hold up to 800 cars of sand to be used in fracking at Marcellus Shale drilling sites throughout northeastern Pennsylvania. Today, the yard remains a hub for the energy extraction industry.
The Reading Blue Mountain and Northern Railroad, with its corporate headquarters in Port Clinton, is a privately held railroad company serving businesses in nine eastern Pennsylvania counties. The railroad runs about 400 miles from Reading, Pennsylvania to Mahoopany, Pennsylvania, and it operates the seven-mile rail line from Tawanda to Monroton in Bradford County. They offer freight services and passenger excursion operations and employ hundreds of employees. The company began operations in September of 1983 as a 13-mile short line operating a state-owned branch line between Hamburg and Temple, Pennsylvania. Named the Blue Mountain and Reading, they rehabbed the line and provided service to freight customers and a passenger excursion business was also developed. Within a few years, the Blue Mountain and Reading took on the operations of three more state-owned branch lines to provide freight service to eastern Pennsylvania industries. In December 1990, Conrail was looking to sell off over 150 miles of branch lines in the anthracite coal regions. The BMNR took on this challenge and expanded the company, changing the name to the Reading, Blue Mountain and Northern. Operations began on December 15, 1990. The first few years saw work to repair the badly neglected trackage and to develop a steady pattern of service for the many industries that relied on rail service. In July of 1992, Conrail sold some additional track near Hazleton to serve the Jetto Coal Company. This would allow the bulk of all remaining rail shipments of anthracite coal to be funneled through Reading. At the same time, the RNN also acquired the connection from East Mahanoy Junction to Oneida and the line to Delano from Schuylkill County. In order to have better control over the supply of empty hopper cars for coal shipments, the RNM began to buy cars in 1995, starting with 265 cars dedicated to Quebec iron and titanium service. By the end of 2013, RNN had purchased over 1,000 freight cars. The RNN had been operating from several former Conrail offices around the system. In late 1995, these offices were combined into a new corporate headquarters at Port Clinton.
As Conrail continued their program of spinning off rail lines that did not fit into its Big X plan, the Reading, Blue Mountain, and Northern expanded again. In August of 1996, they acquired a portion of Conrail's Lehigh Division. Comprised of over 100 miles of mostly ex-Lehigh Valley Railroad trackage, the Lehigh Line stretches from the southern foot of the Pocono Mountains at Lehighton through Wilkesbury and Scranton and onward to Wyoming County. To connect the two divisions, the RNN negotiated trackage rights over the Carbon County owned 18 mile railroad between Hometown and Jim Thorpe. In the fall of 1996, Conrail announced its intention to merge with CSXT, and after a fierce fight over the future of Conrail, CSX and Norfolk Southern ultimately agreed to split Conrail, and on June 1, 1999, NS took over all the portions of Conrail that connected with the RNN. To meet the demands of this expanded traffic base, in 2001, RNN purchased a fleet of higher horsepower six-axle locomotives and retired some of the older units that had begun to wear out. With this move, the RNN became an entirely EMD-powered railroad.
In August of 2001, the RNN completed negotiations with Norfolk Southern and Procter & Gamble to take over exclusive service to P&G's largest manufacturing facility at Mahoopany, Pennsylvania. Working with NS, they were able to provide P&G with a service and rate package which ensured that inbound raw material continued to move by rail. In November of 2001, the RNN reached an agreement to take over the ownership of the track within the Crestwood Industrial Park. With that agreement in place, they were able to guarantee long-term rail service to the many customers located there. Having worked to ensure a steady stream of customer businesses along the Lehigh Division, they turned their attention to reaching agreements for the use of the line as a key transportation corridor. Both Norfolk Southern and Canadian Pacific were interested in using the Lehigh Line as a north-south corridor for goods moving from the Northeast and Canada to the New York City market via Allentown, as well as points south and east of Reading. In June of 2002, they entered into a trackage rights agreement with Norfolk Southern, and in August of 2002, they renewed a prior agreement with the Canadian Pacific. Combined, these two carriers utilized the Lehigh Line to move over 80,000 carloads a year. In the summer of 2002, the RNN began a critical step to enable the direct physical connection of their two divisions without the need to run over any foreign track. And in July, they entered into a long-term lease of two abandoned railroad bridges over the Lehigh River from the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. With that agreement in place, they were able to turn their attention to the restoration of the bridges and rail infrastructure and the necessary work along the Lehigh River to connect the railroads. The project would culminate in the opening of the bridge in November of 2003.
The two divisions were now connected and the Lehigh line had a solid business base from both online customers and overhead traffic rights revenues. The RNN had begun restoring the yard at Penobscot in 2000, which resulted in an agreement made in May of 2003 to have Norfolk Southern deliver inbound interchange cars there, allowing a greatly improved car cycle time. That arrangement lasted until 2020 when NS resigned operations over the RNN Lehigh line. By the time the RNN celebrated its 20th anniversary in the fall of 2003, they had become a very successful short line. They built solid traffic bases on both the Lehigh and Reading divisions and had put in place an operation with upgraded track, locomotives, and freight cars. They were gaining a reputation for customer service and attention to detail. Evidence of their customer focus became clear to all when in 2002, the rail industry publication Railway H chose the Reading, Blue Mountain, and Northern Railroad as Regional Railroad of the Year. They followed that up in 2004 when they were awarded a marketing award from Norfolk Southern Agricultural Products Group for Business Development. MD's SD38 made a name for itself in heavy drag freights and busy hump yards from the hills of Minnesota to the sprawling yards of the Northeast. And though production numbers were small compared to that of the similar SD40, many of these locomotives would change hands several times over their long careers, some of which continue to this day. Reading and Northern number 2003 is a non-dynamic brake equipped SD38 that was built in July of 1971 as the Detroit, Toledo and Ironton number 253 which later became the Grand Trunk Western number 6253. Today, it looks like just another green RNN workaday diesel, but in 2003, it was the classiest locomotive in coal country. We caught up with the 2003 at the grade crossing of Ferndale Road at the Elliott Street intersection in New Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Ferndale Road is one of the main roads into town, while Elliott Street is a short, dead ended residential drive. The 2003's status as a celebrity locomotive came in 2003 with the 20th anniversary of Reading and Northern as a railroad. To commemorate the occasion, the 2003 was painted in a special, one-of-a-kind tribute scheme depicting the road's 20-year history on the sides of the long hood, the cab, and with special silver-painted trucks. 
The loco was a regular visitor to the area and spent much of its time in and around the Penobscot Yard, which is where we caught it numerous times over the course of 2004. And whether it was earning revenue for the railroad or just resting between runs, it's a small but relevant slice of local railroad history. So by now, you've probably noticed the yellow engine behind the 2003. And if you look closely on the nose, you can see where there used to be a shield. So given the color and the shield, it's pretty obvious as to the heritage of this engine. Without keeping you in suspense too long, you get to see the Reading and Northern 3055 and what it looked like in 2004 when we caught it here on Penobscot with the 2003. And this is what she looks like today. Back to the future, the 2003 is just another workaday locomotive for the railroad on just another workday on the railroad. In 2005, the RNN took a big step forward to expand its passenger excursion business with the acquisition of the Lehigh Line and the new connection between Jim Thorpe and the Lehigh River Gorge, the RNN was now positioned to offer the region a tourist attraction. In May of 2005, the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway was born, and every weekend and holiday from May to Christmas, hundreds of visitors to Jim Thorpe board their passenger coaches for a ride into the gorge. As their operation and business expanded, the need to upgrade facilities grew as well. And in the spring of 2006, they opened their brand new Penobscot Yard Office building. With a solid freight business in hand and a growing passenger operation underway, Andy Muller decided to begin the renovation of his steam engines. At the end of 2007, number 425 was back in service, pulling passenger trains and occasionally the company office car specials to take thousands of guests on steam excursion trips throughout the operating territory. The RNN system expanded again in 2009 with the addition of the 7 Mile Tawanda Line near the New York State border. This line is located in the heart of the Marcellus Shale region. In 2011, RNN again was recognized by Railway Age as Regional Railroad of the Year for the development of port operations for the export of anthracite coal. In 2012, the Reading and Northern entered into an agreement with Can Do to purchase the rail assets of the Humboldt Industrial Park in Hazleton, the region's largest rail-served industrial park. The Reading and Northern ultimately took over service to the park and its 11 new customers on January 1, 2016. The Reading and Northern was recognized in 2015 again when they were named the Regional Railroad of the Year by Railway Age magazine making it the third time and them the only railroad to ever achieve that recognition three times. In 2016, they were the winner of the American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association's Marketing Award, making it the third time they won the award, which recognized their establishment of a railroad-operated transload and storage warehouse in Old Forge, Pennsylvania. The evolution of the Blue Mountain and Redding to the Redding, Blue Mountain and Northern to what I simply call the Reading and Northern has been an interesting ride, and one can only wonder where the railroad will be on its 50th anniversary. <laughs>